Well, thanks, uh, Jacob, for your kind words. And sometime during 2018, um, somebody suggested that I write a, a, a kind of a chapter length um, text about tobacco. And from, uh, uh, as I wish, from the perspective that as an anthropologist who works with Amazonian people, we, from the perspective that uh, I felt comfortable with. And I immediately thought of um, doing a, an interview with Rafael Chanchari. He's a, a, a smart, eloquent, uh, um, indigenous uh, fellow in his 50s who's been working with these plants for a long time. Anytime I've spoken previously with Rafael, it had always been uh, interesting and pertinent. Uh, he's actually interviewed in the book that I did in 2005 called Intelligence in Nature. So anytime I have kind of philosophical questions for an indigenous Amazonian uh, thinker, uh, Rafael would certainly be one of the people I would uh, turn to. So um, I happened to be in Iquitos, Peru. I, I asked Rafael whether he'd agree to do a conversation about tobacco. And he accepted, saying that it was uh, one of the uh, uh, most important medicinal plants from the uh, indigenous perspective. And so we uh, met and we did an interview where I simply turned on the tape recorder and asked him questions uh, spontaneously. And um, when I got home and then transcribed this uh, conversation, I felt that it was so good that um, it would be possible to to turn it into something a little bit more than just a, a chapter uh, in some book. And um, what was apparent was that uh, what he said as an indigenous Amazonian person about the plant um, seemed to be um, extremely advanced. So he, he would say things like, um, well, one of the things that tobacco does is that it strengthens the male and female hormones. So hormone is a kind of a scientific term. Uh, Rafael lives in the same world as we all do. He's, he knows about hormones and science. Um, but still, um, I didn't know anything about uh, tobacco or nicotine. Uh, strengthening female and male hormones in the human body. And at this point, this is something that's fairly easy to look up. You can be uh, in your office in the middle of nowhere and go on internet and type uh, uh, testosterone and nicotine or estrogen and nicotine, or even just sex hormones and nicotine. And uh, you'll see that um, this is indeed true. Uh, as an anthropologist, I'm no expert in tobacco or in uh, nicotine or even in the molecular workings of the, the human body, but I know how to read uh, scientific articles and I know how to go back and forth between systems of knowledge. So here, th at this, uh, I figured that this was getting interesting because by giving the microphone to an indigenous Amazonian elder, paying attention to what he said about the tobacco plant, and then going and checking it out in the recent scientific literature about tobacco and nicotine, it became apparent that there were all kinds of direct correspondences between these two apparently different systems of knowledge. And uh, by paying attention to what Raphael said and then paying attention to what scientists were uh, writing about in their different publications. Um, it seemed clear that these two perspectives could be brought together, that they complemented each other. And um, so after doing a chapter where uh, Raphael gets the mic, as it were, I did another chapter where um, I surveyed the current scientific literature on uh, uh, tobacco and uh, nicotine. And then readers can make up their own minds. They can 
see what the indigenous perspective on the plant is and then see what the scientific perspective is on the same subject. And uh, some people may find the indigenous view easier to understand or even more convincing. Other people may find the contrary. Personally, I think of these two different systems of knowledge as um, two languages, um, like French and English, where you can translate, you can go back and forth. Sometimes you can't translate because the concepts don't correspond. Um, uh, but still, uh, some language, one language is better for saying some things, the other language is better for saying other things. There's, there's not that one language is better than another, but just that they, they, they have their respective strengths and weaknesses. And if you're bilingual, you can go back and forth between them and you have more concepts. Uh, so that, for example, as a scientifically trained, academically trained Westerner who has begun to understand the indigenous Amazonian uh, point of view on things, um, I can uh, consider a question scientifically and then say to myself, how would an Amazonian person think about this? And this can generate new ideas, new angles, new hypotheses. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not something that takes away from science, but that adds additional um, perspectives. Um, so uh, after seeing how um, uh, treating tobacco this way uh, produced two simple and clear chapters, um, Raphael gets the mic, science gets the mic. I thought, ah, oh, well, uh, we could actually make a little book of this uh, and just do the same thing with ayahuasca. Start over, go back to Iquitos, give the mic to Raphael, tell us what you know about uh, ayahuasca. And then look at what the science of ayahuasca has been able to determine. Um, in this case, uh, what is immediately apparent is that science has studied tobacco for 200 years. And so actually scientific uh, knowledge about tobacco and nicotine is fairly extensive. Um, but science has only really studied ayahuasca seriously for let's say 30 years. Um, so it's a new science. And so there may be hundreds of publications about ayahuasca right now coming out every year. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that there's a lot that is still um, not really understood um, about ayahuasca, about how it works, uh, about just what is ayahuasca. And, and in the case of ayahuasca, it's very clear that uh, uh, setting up a dialogue between indigenous experts like Rafael Chanchari Pisuri, but there are many others as well, who have deep knowledge about the plant and how it works, and even uh, about the botanical identification of the plant. Um, this is one of the first things that emerges in a dialogue with uh, Rafael is that if from the indigenous point of view, there's not one, uh, one kind of ayahuasca, science would call it Banisteriopsis capi, but several different kinds of ayahuascas with different, uh, and we're just talking about the ayahuasca vine here, not, not about the brew that has the name of the vine. Um, Indigenous Amazonians and uh, other uh, Mestizo Amazonian experts have long recognized that there are different kinds of ayahuasca. The vines have different uh, aspects. They can have knots, uh, they can be smooth. Uh, the, the inner bark has different colors and uh, these different kinds of ayahuascas have different effects. Um, but um, this has simply not been studied and scientists have said that there's only one species. Well, Richard Evans Schultes, the ethno, famous ethnobotanist from Harvard in 
the, uh, the 20th century, he, he said in the 1970s that uh, taking the indigenous point of view on um, the ayahuasca varieties seriously would be an avenue for future research. He also called it a botanical enigma. But uh, this uh, avenue uh, of, for future research was uh, never really explored. Only in 2018 uh, did an international team of um, scientists uh, launch an investigation into this question. Um, these are, uh, this is a very, that's a very basic question. There are other very uh, basic questions about uh, ayahuasca that if you start taking the indigenous point of view seriously, um, then it means uh, that uh, several uh, uh, scientific points of view need to be adapted. And I think the first, for example, is that what uh, Amazonian people say, uh, like Rafael Chanchari, they call ayahuasca the purge. Um, and that's, in their view, the, its first effect before showing you images and so forth, it, uh, it claims you. And um, for them, that's the, the, the beginning and the, the, it's the, 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 the basic, the basis of its therapeutic uh, effect. If you look at uh, contemporary scientific literature on um, ayahuasca, when they, they put uh, people who've taken ayahuasca into uh, brain imaging machines uh, to see what's going on in the brain and the mind of people who've taken ayahuasca. They describe vomiting as, the, uh, as an adverse effect. I mean, obviously, vomiting in uh, fMRI machines is not uh, desirable, um, but still, uh, what is considered to be the, um, the the first effect of ayahuasca, because frankly, when you swallow this bitter brew and it goes down your gullet into your stomach, before inspiring any kind of uh, remarkable uh, visions, it will certainly give you nausea and perhaps uh, produce nausea, so um, uh, produce purging. And so ayahuasca, before being a psychedelic, a revealer of psyche, um, it's a bodily experience, and um, this is just how you experience the plant when you ingest it. Um, and that is how Amazonian people talk about it, before being a plant teacher uh, that uh, shows you things and that allows you to uh, understand things from different angles. The first thing it does is that it purges you. Um, so there are uh, basic aspects of ayahuasca, um, such as the ones that I've just mentioned, that science hasn't really uh, been able to take into account. No doubt uh, also because it's been difficult for scientists up until now to think about engaging a true dialogue with indigenous experts um, on these subjects. Um, it's true that Western medicine does not think that vomiting is something positive. Um, so it does go against the presuppositions of, uh, let's just say, Western medical science. But still, uh, when you work with uh, a powerful vegetal concoction like ayahuasca from the Amazon, um, it almost calls for a, a new kind of science that if you just go into uh, studying ayahuasca as you would study any other thing, um, then you're going to miss um, a lot of uh, essential points. Um, this is a, another thing that is uh, apparent with the, the science of uh, ayahuasca is that there's a, for a long time, scientists wanted to understand, so what is the active ingredient? This is almost like a reductionist scientific uh, obsession. So there, there's got to be an active molecule here. So which one is it? So they looked for a long time and 
they found uh, harmine, harmaline, tetrahydroharmine. These are alkala uh, uh, alkaloids that are uh, uh, harmala alkaloids that are in the uh, vine itself that are um, uh, lightly hallucinogenic, but they don't seem to be present in sufficient quantities to explain the visions that ayahuasca can unleash in people. So um, harmine was never uh, really the uh, sufficient explanation. And it was only in the 1970s that two chemists, one from Switzerland, the other from Sweden, uh, Rivier and Lindgren, uh, found in some ayahuasca brews that there was DMT. And then in the 1980s, the explanation was, even though DMT is usually orally inactive, the harmala alkaloids act as NaO inhibitors. And aha, uh -huh, that is the explanation that what ayahuasca is, is a form of uh, orally active DMT. The harmala alkaloids block the uh, NaO enzyme in the stomach that usually blocks the DMT. And so by combining the chakruna plant that contains the DMT with the vine that has these NaO inhibitors, what you actually have is orally active DMT, and the active ingredient is DMT. Well, the molecular fit seemed perfect, and so everybody, and so this is actually still, I think, the reigning orthodoxy of uh, what is ayahuasca. Um, but there are several fundamental problems with this view, uh, the, the first being that there are uh, numerous indigenous traditions in the Amazon that do not add chakruna, which contains DMT, to the ayahuasca. In fact, that's, that simply uh, prepare vine only ayahuasca. So they take the vine called ayahuasca and they either may do a cold extraction, so they break up the vine and leave it in cold water for a while, or they boil it for a while, a cold extraction or a hot extraction, and they drink that pure vine extract. It contains the harmala alkaloids and several other bioactive substances that have not been studied sufficiently for the moment. And there it is. And when you drink this kind of uh, pure ayahuasca, you get more subtle visions, more subtle colors. It, it is psychoactive and the uh, anthropological literature is full of reports um, by people like uh, Richard Spruce, the 19th century uh, uh, ethnobotanist, or uh, 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 Rachel Dolmatov, the uh, Colombian uh, anthropologist, who had vine-only extracts and then described their visions. In other words, you don't need the chakruna and the DMT to have visionary ayahuasca. And in fact, what ayahuasca is, is a cocktail. It's, it's a vine that you can then boil up with many different plants. Um, Jonathan Ott uh, repertory 97 different plants used in the Amazon as uh, additives to ayahuasca, so that any given ayahuasca can either be pure vine or it can contain uh, tobacco or coca or datura or uh, chakuna, which means that it can also contain uh, nicotine or cocaine uh, or DMT uh, or scopolamine, so that um, it, it is a, it, it can be a, a, a mix of psychoactive substances depending on who prepared it, what plants were available, and what they were uh, uh, trying to do, what kind of brew they were, were wanting to prepare. Um, so ayahuasca by no means is defined as a kind of a standardized mix of vine on the one hand and DMT containing chakuna on the other. Uh, ayahuasca has uh, more or less the same meaning as cocktail. It's, it's by definition a mix. There is no standard cocktail and there, there can be no standard ayahuasca, but when you read the uh, scientific literature, 
now on uh, ayahuasca. The, if you read the small print, the conditions of the research, invariably they'll, they'll tell you that uh, the research was conducted using a, a batch of standardized ayahuasca uh, brewed from the vine Banisteriopsis capi and from the Chacruna plant Upsicotria viridis. So um, because science wants standardized uh, substances to study, it invents this fiction of what is ayahuasca um, that actually um, uh, blacks out or, or, or hides the, the rest of what is uh, really true in terms of the varieties of ayahuasca as they are brewed up across the Amazon. Um, so that's also where uh, taking, uh, if you're going to study a plant like uh, ayahuasca and you're a scientist, you really gain from taking indigenous knowledge about this Amazonian plant seriously because they have real uh, uh, deep um, practice-based knowledge. And uh, by taking it seriously, you can avoid making a, uh, a lot of mistakes. And so, um, back to the book and to the, the book talk, I thought that uh, the interesting thing would be to make it short, um, small, not long. It doesn't take long to read. It's that, so there are these two plants, there are these two perspectives uh, on these two plants. And uh, you can, if you're interested in these plants, you can read the Amazonian perspective, read the scientific perspective, and then um, figure out what's uh, useful uh, for you. But it's also uh, a, a small uh, exercise uh, that shows that it's easy to talk with indigenous people and listen to them and learn from them. And it's easy then to uh, think about the same things from a scientific perspective. And it's actually easy, I find, to go back and forth between the two. And I don't think the point is to, to try to figure out which perspective you uh, prefer. It's that they complement each other. And so they're, they're both good. They're both interesting. And, and what is uh, above all interesting is the fact that they can be combined, that uh, you can become bilingual. Um, it, it takes more work, I think. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, when they have the, uh, the, the, the privilege of being monolingual, only speaking uh, English, let's say, and so, okay, it's a lot easier. You don't have to waste any time with those French verbs, Italian verbs, Spanish verbs, or any of that, uh, and you can do other things. It's true. It does take there's initial kind of time investment. But um, when you have that second language under your belt, suddenly you have these new words, new ways of thinking of things. And uh, I think that the if we're talking about uh, uh, specifically Amazonian plants like uh, tobacco and ayahuasca, um, being able to uh, understand the uh, uh, Amazonian approach to these plants, and then being able to understand the scientific understanding of these plants, and being able to go back and forth between these two perspectives, um, I think uh, equips people with the with what you need to know if you're going to be uh, interacting with these plants. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, on all questions in the world, uh, do people need to go back and forth between different systems of knowledge? But certainly when working with these two um, plants, I think it, it's, it just makes a basic sense. It's, um, I think that, so the Amazonians would say these are plant teachers. Um, scientists might say that both tobacco and ayahuasca enhance cognition. Um, I think that's, those are just different ways of saying the same thing. 
but uh, one thing is pretty clear is that uh, uh, when you work with powerful plants like uh, tobacco and ayahuasca and you ingest them so that uh, what then occurs is a modification of your consciousness and of your, your body state and so forth, um, this is uh, risky territory. Uh, it's like going uh, mountain climbing when you're not a professional alpinist. Yeah, so it's that's why you want to before you go uh, uh, doing that kind of. It's an extreme sport working with these um, powerful plants, and so uh, that's why doing one's homework uh, first and uh, getting understanding of just what one is dealing with is um, part of. Um, I think what what makes uh, what makes basic sense. So um, that's what I would say uh, about this book. Uh, but I'd also say that the whole point is not uh, uh, for me to talk about it and for you to be listening to this and say, "Okay, I got it." The whole point with, is to read it. Um, you know. The, the words are there and they've been lined up and uh, this book is made for reading and uh, but also critiquing and uh, digesting um, and um, so so that's it uh, and at this point I'd be happy to take uh, any questions well here's a question from Don uh, how is tobacco used in the Amazon? Uh, I assume smoking is not the only use? Yeah, um, I had the uh, good fortune of being with um, uh, people, the Ashanika people in the Peruvian Amazon. I think they, they use it uh, in, in all possible means, which is uh, they smoke it, they eat it, they drink it, they sniff it, and they also... Um, uh, do rectal absorption through enemas. So um, they, you know, they don't put it in their ears, but uh, they use it in many different forms. It's a medicine because simply the uh, leaves uh, can be applied to wounds. They accelerate the healing of wounds. They disinfect them. Uh, they are, uh, I mean, nicotine is, is an analgesic uh, painkiller. So um, uh, what uh, in Ashaninka, so this is the language of the people that I was living with, uh, the word for shaman is sheri piari. Sheri means tobacco. So you have a problem, you go and see the tobacco doctor. And the first thing the tobacco doctor will do, most probably if you have a wound uh, or a fever, will blow some tobacco smoke on you. And we're not talking industrial cigarettes here. Um, I mean, this is also a, a, a fundamental misunderstanding is that in, uh, in the Western world, people associate uh, tobacco with industrial cigarettes, which are uh, a long way away from this uh, dark, uh, powerful, by, I say dark, I mean brownish, um, Amazonian tobacco is brownish. It has 20 times more nicotine than the blonde tobacco that they uh, grow in Virginia and other places. Um, the um, tobacco industry has um, uh, selected plants that are weak in nicotine, and then they've sauced them up with hundreds of different chemicals so that when you uh, burn uh, one of these nicotine delivery devices, which is how they think of uh, cigarettes, uh, you're actually getting uh, a mix of uh, poisonous chemicals that um, are not present when you burn this Amazonian tobacco. Um, so it's difficult to even have a conversation because we're not even talking about the same thing. Um, uh, Amazonian tobacco, and I'm not saying that it's not dangerous. In fact, it should be clear that uh, what nicotine is, uh, is an insecticide. In other words, the plant produces it to kill insects that eat its leaves. And 
uh, if you could extract the nicotine that is in three industrial cigarettes and just boil it down into a drop of pure nicotine, that drop would kill you if you put it on your skin or on your tongue. So nicotine is a deadly poison. Um, and uh, you, if you have never had any tobacco and then suddenly you take a large dose of uh, uh, tobacco tea from the Amazon, you actually do risk uh, dying from nicotine overdose. So um, uh, Amazonian tobacco is extremely powerful and is better understood as a hallucinogen, uh, really. I mean, it's a, a plant from the nightshade family. It's not exactly a psychedelic in terms of even the uh, receptors that it uh, activates. Um, it, it activates similar receptors to the ones activated by Datura. So we're more in a kind of a delirium hallucinogen than a psychedelic hallucinogen even. Uh, so, but it is still uh, extremely powerful um, and um, it can be dangerous, but not at all for the same reasons as uh, industrial cigarettes. And uh, well, Paracelsus said already that uh, uh, the, the poison is in the dose. And so something that can be uh, poisonous and deadly, depending on how you um, dose it, it can become therapeutic. Um, just about the, the levels of nicotine, um, when you smoke uh, uh, any uh, tobacco, the good news is that most of the nicotine is destroyed in the combustion. And so, because if, if you could uh, have access to all the nicotine that's in the uh, tobacco that you smoke, uh, you would die from nicotine overdose. So actually smoking tobacco um, has that advantage, is that it protects you from having a nicotine overdose. And actually, if you're smoking tobacco that's too powerful, too strong in nicotine, and you smoke it and you inhale, and, and you get a sort of a very heavy dose of nicotine, you will pass out before you can keep on smoking. So smoking is a way that uh, it's, it's the least risky way of working with powerful tobacco. Um, rectal absorption, in case you're tempted, is the most dangerous way. You put a plug of powerful tobacco in your anus and uh, it, it will, the nicotine that's in it will be entirely absorbed very quickly and <laughs> you simply risk dying. Um, so, um, though, so it should be clear that uh, shamanic Amazonian tobacco is a powerful and dangerous plant. You need to know how to use it. But they use it uh, in external applications like a nicotine patch as a painkiller in case of snake bite, uh, in cases of wounds, um, and as a kind of a general remedy. That's why the doctor is called the tobacco doctor, is that first and foremost, when in doubt, blow smoke on people. It'll calm them. It'll take away some of their pain. And then the tobacco shamans also use the tobacco for the diagnostic to think about the case that they have in front of them. So that's why you will see, that's why tobacco is the number one plant medicine across indigenous Amazonia. Um, so that's how I'd answer the question. Thank you. There's a question from Cindy. Uh, she writes, uh, what is the spiritual purpose of taking ayahuasca? I've had two journeys and they were very different and yet, had some similarities. They referred to the plant medicines as grandmother. Can you speak to the spiritual side of ayahuasca? Um, actually, you know, I, I quibble with the word spiritual, I, I've got to say. Um, and so uh, I'll just go right ahead and quibble with it so as to answer uh, the question. Um, Spirit is, uh, uh, it's a Western concept. It's a, a word that comes from the Latin spiritus that uh, refers to the breath of God. Spiritus means breath. Um, it's defined in dictionaries as an immaterial principle. Um, and so there is this dichotomy between matter and spirit. So uh, spirit is 
what matter isn't. Um, the Ashaninka people with whom I lived, for example, when you would talk to them about the entity, they said, so plants, animals, people, there are these um, entities inside us that animate us. Um, they're invisible. In our language, they're called maninkari. Maninkari means those who are hidden. It doesn't mean those who are immaterial. It means those who you normally don't see, but when you take ayahuasca, when you, when you take tobacco, you can see them. Um, these maninkari, they are also ashaninka, which is their word for themselves. It means people like us. So the invisible, the normally invisible entities that animate all living beings, um, they are people like us. They make the kinship that we have with other species. And when these entities leave the organisms that they animate, these organisms die. So they're part and parcel of living organisms. They're not that immaterial in indigenous concepts. So when missionaries or anthropologists fly into the Amazon and they say, okay, so what are your concepts here? And people say, oh, well, there are, we think that there are maninkari animating living beings. Uh, the uh, uh, outsiders say, oh yeah, so according to the Ashaninka, there are invisible spirits inside plants and so forth. But no, they didn't say spirits. They didn't say uh, this uh, immaterial thing. They have this other concept. Um, so uh, spiritual, um, you know, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Personally, I, I'm an agnostic. Um, and so, um, uh, I mean, I, I get the point spiritual, you know, like, for example, uh, when I go out into my garden, uh, I like gardening. I like being out there with the plants and the bees and so forth uh, and the quietness. Um, is it spiritual? I don't know. I mean, so somebody might say, oh, yes, he, he's a, a spiritual gardener. Other people might say, no, no, he's just raking up the leaves, you know. Um, personally, I, I don't put that label on it, and I'm not quite sure uh, uh, what it might mean. Um, I know that I'm not religious in the sense of, like, an official religion with texts and so forth. Um, Grandmother Ayahuasca, I mean, if, if you look in plant teachers, I, I think we kind of discreetly shot that concept down. Because if you ask somebody like Rafael Chanchari, um, it, it's quite interesting. These different plant teachers in, in indigenous concepts do have genders. Um, tobacco, for example, is notably masculine across, and I'm not saying this is what I think, it is that all indigenous Amazonian cultures agree about this. So, I mean, that's striking. Um, uh, but then, so what do they say about ayahuasca? Because yes, they say that the entities that animate plants like tobacco and ayahuasca, they can call them mother or owner or father. So a lot of people have heard about the mother of ayahuasca. So they think, ah, the spirit of ayahuasca is feminine. But no, uh, actually, when we start the, the conversation off with Rafael Chanchari on tobacco, the first conversation, he starts telling me about the mother of tobacco and, and, th and that it's a masculine entity. That was my first question. So you're saying the mother is a man? Yes, the mother is a man, and, and then off it goes. Um, well, okay, so the owner of tobacco or the mother of tobacco is this masculine entity according to indigenous concepts. What about ayahuasca? What's interesting about ayahuasca, and you can find this in the uh, anthropological literature, it's not just Rafael Chanchari Pisuri, but that um, what is striking about the uh, uh, essence or the personality or the owner of ayahuasca, sometimes masculine, uh, sometimes feminine, and, and that's the whole point, is that um, it's, it's always changing. Um, it, it's, it can be both. Um, it's certainly not Grandmother Ayahuasca with capital G and capital A. Um, but the Westerners who have gone down there recently, 
and who have looked into it uh, fairly quickly. And they think, ah, the mother of ayahuasca, ah, the grandmother of ayahuasca. And so there's this new concept generated by Western ayahuasca drinkers. And, you know, I don't want to say that people are wrong or anything to talk about grandmother ayahuasca. I mean, sometimes ayahuasca can come, can incarnate itself in your visions as a grandmother, sometimes as a grandfather, sometimes as a hummingbird, sometimes as an army of male and female doctors, um, sometimes as a black boa, sometimes as a yellow boa. Um, ayahuasca has no fixed persona. Uh, and that's the uh, indigenous point of view. So knowing that um, uh, it's like ayahuasca has no fixed recipe either, which is what I was talking about before. Um, I think saying, oh yes, there is a standard form of ayahuasca and it's uh, the vine and the chacuna. It's like saying, ah, the mother of ayahuasca is this grandmother figure. It's sort of, you know, turning it into this monolithic thing Whereas the whole point is that that's not what it is, you know, so, um, but of course it's a, it's a free world and people want to sort of, you know, make a kind of a new religion out of ayahuasca and say the grandmother ayahuasca is the sort of, uh, you know, deity that goes with the plant. Uh, who am I to say that they shouldn't be doing this? But still, I would invite them to read the book and then to, to think uh, again, you know, that actually... I do think that ayahuasca initially belongs to Amazonian people. And so that if we're gonna have respect for uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous people, indigenous plants, then it's important to take their point of view into consideration. And their point of view is that ayahuasca has no fixed persona. Thank you. What are your thoughts on plant medicine, such as ayahuasca, being used in like a contemporary therapeutic context? Well, it's true that when you when you look at um, how the the Western world kind of can fit in with the indigenous world, that the interface is not always uh, easy, and um, I mean, we'll, let's not talk about it because there's been a lot of just taking indigenous plants and taking them away and then extracting the active ingredients. And then there's nothing for the people who initially discovered the plants and so voila. Um, here, uh, it's true that um, the therapeutic medical laboratory active ingredient approach, um, which has pharmaceutical companies just behind it. They've got markets, turns out works as an antidepressant. And there's a billion dollar, $2 billion a year market for an effective uh, antidepressant. So, I mean, um, and it turns out that in, in, in research conducted in uh, Brazil, uh, one dose of ayahuasca is having a, a noticeable, uh, a positive uh, impact on people with chronic depression that and that last one dose will last for eight months whereas the antidepressants that are on the market are these daily pills and that don't even work as well so um i mean one of the problems here is is that it might actually become real uh, uh soon and it's you know as soon as there are billions of dollars involved it's going to get pretty complicated that said um I think it's all about bringing together different forms of knowledge for the good of, of humanity. So that if, if there actually are illnesses and people suffering, if we can combine um, Amazonian plants, scientific knowledge, and, and somehow, even though it's not an easy fit, even though turning it into a pill that the FDA will recognize often sort of changes the whole thing and, 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 and it, it's, it's, it's not an easy fit and it's filled with contradictions. Uh, but still the, the, the idea that these two approaches can uh, be brought together and uh, be good for human health, uh, I think is a, is a positive thing. And that 
the, the frictions that are, are visible are interesting frictions and they gain from being uh, addressed and up front and on the table. And that's the whole point of this book is to show that actually sitting down at a table and talking with an indigenous expert is fairly easy. All you got to do is do it and have an open mind. But then once you draw all the consequences of that knowledge and then scientific knowledge and then how they can be brought together and then what do we do with that, that's when it gets complicated. Um, but that doesn't mean that we've got to turn away from it or, or, or it's, it just is, makes, it, uh, makes it more, uh, it spices it up really. Thank you. Uh, what are some ways that uh, you've referenced this, but what are some, some examples of how science and shamanistic views differ around tobacco and nicotine as well as with ayahuasca? Well, um, finally, when talking about um, a plant, like let's just say um, tobacco. Um, so what is tobacco? Uh, the, the scientific view um, seems to be tobacco is a plant uh, that contains um, different uh, molecules. It actually is a, a small chemical factory. It produces 4,000 different kinds of molecules. The one that interests science most is nicotine, but there are several others in there. Um, it's an alkaloid. So these are uh, secondary molecules that the plant produces and that don't actually play an immediate role inside the plant. So they're there secondary uh, uh, molecules are there for interacting with the outside world. Um, so the, and the plant puts a lot of energy into producing uh, these substances and in particular nicotine. Finally, from the scientific point of view, the plant is a bag of molecules. And what we're really interested in is those molecules. So it all kind of boils down to nicotine. And actually, if I've been talking about the science of tobacco, but it's most often the science of nicotine. I mean, you know, science went molecular uh, in the 70s, 80s. And so then it's all about DNA, proteins, receptors, and molecules. And that's what, you know, biology, the organism is lost and even the cell is, is out of the picture. We're down with the molecules. And that's what we're interested in. And in the case of tobacco, it's the nicotine. So what is tobacco? It's a bag of nicotine. I'm simplifying, but finally, you know, that's kind of how it is. On the indigenous side, they're saying, no, a uh, bag, no, it's not a bag. It's an entity. It's like a person. It's, uh, it's a plant teacher. It's a powerful being. Um, it's a master plant. You can't master it. You got to make sure it doesn't master you. Um, interacting with this plant, you can learn a lot of things, but it can really kick your butt. You got to be careful. Um, this, you've got to respect it. You got to know it. Uh, you don't fool around with it. It's like a powerful person, um, like a powerful teacher. It's like, you know, going and seeing a sort of famous university professor or something. Uh, and so um, this is the big difference right here is that indigenous people personify plants and animals to know them. Science objectifies plants and animals to know them. So that is a, a kind of a basic difference. Um, I think that when, when we think about this difference, so, so is tobacco a bag of uh, nicotine or is it a sort of sentient and powerful uh, entity that has something like a personality? Um, I think it can be both, and I simply think about my own experience of being an organism in the world. I am a bag of molecules. I am a, a, a bag of flesh and bones, and, you know, that if we, we cut the flesh, uh, blood will come dripping out of it. Um, that's true. Um, but I think that I am also a person. In other words, you can be a flesh bag. And you can also be a person at the same time. 
uh, there is no contradiction between those two points of view. Uh, Amazonian people actually do not make this, they, they're not in this dichotomy between matter and spirit. They're uh, in certain languages, like the uh, in Rafael Chanchari's language, Shawi, the, the word that we translate as spirit, Wayan in Shawi, is the same word for talking about the essence of the wood of the plant when you uh, soak it in water. And so that the spirit of the plant is also the physical manifestation, its taste, its smell, it's that milky thing you see when you uh, let the plant soak in water. Um, so uh, for uh, Rafael Chanchari, nicotine, uh, uh, tobacco clearly contains substances. It is also a powerful entity that has something like a personality and that when you ingest it, this entity impacts on your personality and shows you things. So um, the friction that the, the original question, what is the, what is, where are there friction between the, the two sides is that um, the hard hardcore hard boiled scientist will say uh, tobacco is only the nicotine molecules it contains. Okay, you can believe that if you want, and you can believe there's all the rest is just, you know, uh, uh, superstitious and superfluous uh, stuff. But I actually think that understanding a plant like tobacco, uh, it helps to personify it as well. So you can talk about the nicotine that it contains, and I think that's important. But understanding that it's a powerful entity that can impact your personality and that for all extents and purposes, it has something like a personality. I mean, it's powerful, it's uh, addictive, uh, it can mislead you, it can inspire you. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, interacting with a plant like tobacco is like meeting a powerful person. So even if tobacco was not really a person and, and that question is still undetermined, um, it's like a person. And having the capacity to understand it as such, I think gives you more tools to be able to deal with it. And if, if people who consume tobacco on a regular basis uh, knew uh, that it's not only that it contains nicotine and other substances that might be bad for your health, but that it is like a powerful person that can kick your butt and that you gotta understand how to approach if you're going to uh, work with this plant uh, productively and uh, by causing the, the least harm to yourself as possible. But actually combining objectifying tobacco with personifying tobacco and, and bringing those two points of view together gets you to a place where you have a better understanding of what's going on. So I think the, the, that is really where there are the fundamental differences and frictions between these two ways of understanding, but still they can be uh, overcome. Thank you. Well, this is uh, really fascinating. We've reached the hour. I feel like we could have talked for hours on this. It's so very interesting. And um, just this convergence of science and shamanism uh, so I will continue to explore this, and I know our listeners will as well. And I wish to remind everybody, uh, Plant Teachers, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge is available from uh, Banyan Books. So you can visit Banyan, B-A-N-Y-E-N dot com. And um, on behalf of Banyan Books, thank you all for coming today. And thank you, Dr. Jeremy Narby. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.